12 years ago, DC Universe Online arrived. All the DC fans ran to play in the streets of Metropolis and Gotham. As someone who has played the game off and on over the years, one question always stays with me. How is this game still going strong so many years later? To fully understand how a game can make it 12 years and counting, we first need to go back to where it all began. On November 1st, 2011, DC Universe Online officially released Free to Play. Keep in mind, 2011 was a massive time for gaming. Batman Arkham City, Skyrim, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, Minecraft, and Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, just to name a few. So, as you can tell, there is no shortage of competition in 2011. So how did DC Universe Online get so many players engaged early on? Well, there's a couple reasons. Firstly, it was released to console, which is different than most of its genre. I know I personally always look for MMOs on console that are more engaging than the ones I usually come across. Second, DC Universe Online allowed the player to create a custom superhero and instantly start roaming the streets of Metropolis and Gotham. In a time where the superhero craze was continuing to skyrocket, who wouldn't want to create a unique superhero and go around destroying enemies with powerful attacks, especially when it's free and you can play with friends? Soon as you load into character creation, you are instantly hit with so many different customization options, which for the time were pretty cool. I'm scared to admit how much time I've spent on character creation over the years, between looks, powers, weapons, movement, and mentors, there are so many combinations that truly affect your playstyle. The base customization options were a bit underwhelming stylistically even in 2011, but that's fine, you can unlock cooler styles later on through just playing content and defeating enemies. They wanted your base character to look like a noob, and it's pretty funny to see what people came up with. You could try and make a replica of an already popular hero or villain, or create your own unique character from scratch. The great part of character creation in DC Universe Online was the ability to change just about anything later on. Especially now with the ability to change any part of your character for real life currency, it's made it significantly easier to take risk on your character. If you mess up your character, don't worry, just switch something later on. The three most important parts of character creation are the mentor, movement, and powers. Mentors are most important for the early game, making you choose between being a hero or a villain depending on your choice, as well as the city and missions you will be doing for the first part of the game. In the end game, heroes and villains can actually work together, but we'll talk about that a bit later on. Movement is how you will get around the world, whether it be super speed, acrobatics, or flying. They also added in a fourth called skimming. That is actually what I use. I find super speed to be the coolest. It's just harder to get around, especially when you're in raids that seem to be only made for flyers. You will have trouble running around and getting stuck on certain items, but there's no real advantage in combat or any flying mode. The powers determine your abilities combat strategies, and role in groups. Each power is able to be the DPS role with a secondary role of either controller, healer, or tank. Power roles matter a lot in the late game. Without the right combination of roles for high level content, the missions become almost impossible to complete. At launch, the lack of different customization for powers was definitely a hindrance as there were only six powers available which is a pretty low amount for a game based off a of superhero customization. Luckily, by the time most players would have picked it up when the game was free, hard light was already added with electricity and earth coming shortly after in the next couple of months. Within the first couple of years, another five powers were added from the original six, so anybody that picked the game up in that time would have been happy to see the options of customization. Before you get to the late game content, which you will spend most of your time on, you will need to complete one of the longest tutorials in gaming. I use the word tutorial here very loosely. Some players consider the game up to level 30, which is the main story, to be just tutorial and learning for the late game. Although it has gone faster over time, to get to level 30, it was a good 20 hours if not, depending on how you choose to play the game and at what pace. 
especially in the early days before everyone focused on efficiency, you could spend a lot of time enjoying the game before you ever reached level 30. Over the years, the debate has gone back and forth to the point where Daybreak added in skips for the players who want to create a new character without grinding to level 30 and completing the story again. I personally enjoyed the first 30 levels. Sure, it does get repetitive over the years, especially with the more characters you create. I mean, I have probably made 20 characters, but assuming you are playing the game for the first time back in 2011, I don't see any argument to be made. It's not a tutorial, it's a story mode that helps introduce all of the mechanics of the game and also helps familiarize you with the cities. By the time you reach the end game at level 30, you should have a good grasp on how to play the game, which helps with that late game content. And it's cool to complete missions where you fight iconic villains and fight alongside iconic heroes, or the opposite if you did choose to be a villain. If you don't like that, then you must not like superheroes. The story itself is very linear and open-ended, focused on being able to add in never-ending late game content. The focus of the story was not to have an outcome that ended, but to leave room to continue the game, which I think is an obvious tactic for an MMO. The only small differences come in the mentor missions. Each mentor has three different arcs, one when you first load in, one around level 15, and the last mission at level 30. Between those missions, you are free to choose whichever leveling content you would like, which is useful if you and a friend choose different mentors but would still like to play together. Especially because it does take so long, players would have stopped playing if they realized it took 20 hours to play with friends. None of the rewards you get from the story missions will be useful after you hit level 30, so enjoy the time you spend in the open world exploring and getting better at combos as you will learn most of the game later on. This made the game very easy for a new player to enjoy, as there is no hard mechanics that will be needed until after level 30, by which you should understand the game. Even the roles are not needed until after you complete the main story. If you want to test out the roles, you can, but it's not necessary. I don't think I even knew what roles were until after level 30 my first time around. It's very obvious that Sony wanted the focus on DC Universe Online to be enjoyment, loading in and enjoying the game with your friends, having no big learning curves for new players, whereas a lot of other MMOs are hard to join in and learn where to go or what to do. DC Universe lays it out perfectly for new players to have fun while still learning the game. Early on, some players did have problems with bugs like running out of story missions before level 30 if they did not complete one other piece of side content. Since then, that's been fixed, and if you do the last mentor mission, you instantly get leveled up to 30. The problem was easily avoidable as long as you completed other side content in your journal, whether it was beginner alerts, booster gold missions, or completing every other side mission during the main story. Content itself was a nice mix of instance missions that get us ready for endgame content and open world activities that could at times become overpopulated. Even though they were crowded, it was fun seeing all of the different players at your level fighting the same enemies you were. Luckily, you can invite nearby players to groups that can have up to 4 players, which makes it easier to help each other complete the mission instead of fighting over the enemies or resources available. Most of the missions follow the same path, go to one section on the map, complete the objectives, go to a second area, repeat, and then you would go inside a building to complete the instanced boss, which is similar if not the same as some of the duos you will play after level 30. Some players found this to be too repetitive. I personally found it to be fine since the missions were always different. Sometimes you had to defuse bombs, other times defeat enemies, and then sometimes you would run into the most wanted enemies and get one-shotted. Yeah, that was always fun. While you leveled up to level 30, you would earn skill points and power points, which are now completely gone to pick and choose which powers you want to use for your character. Now they switched power points out for a better system, just giving you the abilities at certain levels on your way to 30. 
I'm not really sure why they didn't have this at launch. It makes a lot more sense. Before, you would only be able to unlock some of the powers and would have to respect just to switch them out. This makes it a lot easier to test out different builds while you complete the story without having to spend your in-game currency to respect. Not that currency had that much purpose, especially in early game, but it's still annoying having to go to the watchtower every time. Skill points hold a lot more value today, as a person with 100 skill points and a certain level will be stronger than a player at the same level with no skill points. Skill points are used to upgrade not only your weapon combos, but most importantly a way to boost your stats past the gear stats. Skill points are a great way to reward players who complete in-game objectives called feats by playing more of the content. Especially in the later years since the ridiculous amounts of level boosting and microtransactions have taken over. In the early days, most of the power came from your CR level as the skill point system was not as good as it is currently. Luckily, they did the overhaul years back to update the system. Once you reach level 30 and complete the story, this is what is considered the main portion of the game. The game at this point consisted of grinding out mainly instance content to get higher level gear pieces. This is where the freedom to play how you want is actually finally available. I know that may sound counterintuitive because of how simple I laid out the content, but you actually unlock so many more options to play the game. You now can start playing more PvP content whether that be with your created characters in Arena PvP or through Legends PvP where you can choose a DC character and use them for PvP. Legends PvP was an easy way to play the PvP mode without needing to have the PvP gear for a created character. Sure, you still need to grind currency to unlock more Legends, but that's to be expected. Unlocking more characters as you play is an obvious tactic in just about every game. Arena PvP on launch was actually a ton of fun to play before the PvP gurus came around and it got progressively harder to find a balanced game of players who were casual in the PvP scene. Nowadays, if you search on forums, you will see complaints of no fixes to PvP, which is unfortunate, but also it does make sense for a game that is focused on PvE. If they nerf a power in PvP, that means it also gets nerfed in PvE which sucks for the player that is using that power for PvE only. At this point, 12 years later, the only real fix to PvP is to give everyone a base loadout that's even based on their powers and go from there. I'm not even sure that would revive it, but it's the best case scenario. The PvE content is where most players spend their time on. No longer did you fly around the city to complete missions, but you instead switch to the on duty tab which has been changed drastically since 2011. That was a bit disappointing as I ended up standing in the meta wing of the watchtower almost religiously since all I needed to do was sell the old gear I had to the vendor in between missions. I think incorporating more open world content into the end game content would create more disparity. Early on I remember there being some open world content that allowed the player to fight bosses that would respawn and they would give really cool styles as well as decent CR. Over time, they have adapted and created more areas to go to and complete daily missions that allows players new areas to roam. One of the earliest ones I remember is going to Central City to help the Flash. You would also be able to unlock more unique styles and defeat new bosses in the area. This helps switch up the content. Instead of just loading into missions from the on duty, you could go and complete daily missions in these areas for unique currency and styles. In the early days, the on duty menu was simple to navigate and figure out what needed to be done to level up, which I think helps more casual players. You could look on the on duty tab to see which missions you qualify for level wise and queue up in your choice of role. Nowadays, even as someone who has grinded the game off and on for years, it's so confusing to look at the menus, let alone figure out what I need to grind to level up. I couldn't imagine being a first time player loading into the game and figuring out what to do. Simplicity is key for any game that is planning on having players take breaks and return to the game later on. And MMOs are the exact genre for that. 
Early on in the game's cycle, the end game content created a massive challenge for players, as the gap between the max level and being a beginner in the end game was so low, there was really no such thing as being carried. Most of the skill came in learning your moveset and being able to position yourself correctly in the boss battles. This is where the game really strived. The combat system was extremely well done. I know it's not perfect by any means, but it was easy to understand and use, but hard to master. That is exactly how you create a skill gap, even in a game focused on PvE. This allowed the perfect environment for higher level players to show their skill while still helping the team succeed. Being able to chain your combos together and perfectly utilizing and timing your abilities for your role was important and noticeable who was putting in the most help for your team through the leaderboard. Every weapon had unique combos and abilities that helped in different ways, whether it was doing more damage or even knocking some enemies down. Every power had a place depending on playstyle. Every role was important in their own way. The DPS was there to do just as much damage as possible. Every single power type could use the damage role, so almost everyone, if not everyone, has tried that role at one point. It seems simple enough, but because of the difference in power types and weapon types, there were unique ways you can approach DPS. The tank's job is to keep all of the enemies attacking them, so the rest of the team doesn't take as much damage. Once again, the different power types allowed for different mechanic styles based off preference. Sure, some powers would be better than others, but any of them would do as long as played correctly. The controller would give power to the team so everyone can continue to use their abilities. Controllers tend to do the second most damage out of any class as well, which is useful for alerts and raids. The healer is there to give health back to the team and provide shields for teammates. I can honestly say the DC Universe approach to roles is one of the most balanced approaches I have seen. Every single role has its own advantages and disadvantages. Sure, in a 1v1 PvP, maybe specific roles had massive advantages, but in the PvE game type, each and every role helped to complete the mission. There were times you could utilize a tankless team in alerts, or only one healer in a team of 8 for raids, it is always dependent on the team you have, which allows for more unique experiences depending on your group's skill level. And since there were scoreboards, you can see who in your group is not picking up the slack. Over the 12 years since launch, there has been 45 episodes full of new content and higher level gear. But with each new content piece, that means less people on lower level content. And with less people on lower level content, that means when you do find a party after a long wait, you will more than likely be getting carried by someone who is significantly overleveled. I really don't know if there is another way around the leveling system to keep it more balanced over time. The only way I can personally think of this is less content with less CR boost, but then high leveled players will be getting bored when there is no new content to play. That's really the unfortunate aspect of any longevity game. Over time, the new players will slow down as the game reaches its full audience, and then slowly over time it dwindles down into more of the end game players and less new players. I will give it to them, 45 episodes of content is a lot of new and exciting missions and powers to have the players use. It's definitely a massive reason the game has been able to be successful for so long. Even if you hit max level on one character, and don't want to grind a second character, which a lot of people do, then within a few months you would have new DLC with new raids, alerts, or powers to sink your teeth into. The biggest problem with the content for the majority of the years has been changed recently, but from the beginning most of the content was behind a paywall. The game originally was set to create DLC to be purchased or used through a monthly membership. Early on, when a game is thriving and at its peak, it works. As the player base dwindles down, it becomes less appetizing for casual players to spend their money on a community that has lowered in player count. I know that was one of the major reasons I stopped playing. I wanted to play, but the high level content was behind a paywall that was about $15 a month, so I would wait for free months or grind for one month extremely hard to catch up and then cancel it until I wanted to play again. 
I find this to be a massive problem with MMOs in general, but especially for MMOs like DC Universe where cash is not a huge component of the game. I'll use a game like RuneScape as an example. It's another game that has most of its content behind a monthly membership. It still does to this day. But back in 2013, they added in the ability to pay for membership within the game by purchasing a bond. This allowed players who don't want to spend $10 a month or so, I believe for DC Universe, the legendary, it is $15. You can just grind the game and basically get free membership. DC Universe is not a game created for grinding cash as you can get to the end game levels without the need for cash. So for them to implement a system in game over the years for in game membership for currency, it would have been kind of hard. But I would have liked to see a world where I could have earned more bank spots, use the full marketplace, besides using real life currency for membership. Another massive problem with DC Universe over the years is the addition of pay to win essentially or pay to skip in a lot of ways. In the beginning, since players could only level from playing content and grinding feats for skill points, there were a lot of people who were spread out from the lowest to the highest level available even after new DLCs were released. A CR80 carrying a CR60 is a lot different than a CR300 carrying a CR60. Years ago, they decided to add combat rating level skips into the game, which basically allows the player to skip almost all of the content and go directly towards the end game. Besides making money off of this system, I really don't see how adding in the ability to skip most of the game is a good idea unless you're purely an end game player. The second addition of being able to buy artifacts, allies, which are pretty new, I haven't actually used them yet, augments, or even basic supplies or source marks all from real life money is also a big game killer because it kills the need to grind the content and play the game continually. If new higher level equipment comes out, you can go to the store to purchase the source marks, go buy new high level gear. It's basically a way to skip to end game content, which I find the most boring. The fun for me is grinding the content to get up to that max level. I actually think keeping those types of buyables out of the marketplace allows for more players to take breaks and come back without feeling like they lost so much ground. The reason is, if I leave at 100 CR and now I come back to play again, now no one is playing my content because everyone skipped the levels. So now I cannot play at a competitive level unless I skip myself. If I do play my content, more than likely I will get carried by someone way over leveled. If everyone who came back at level 100 CR now needed to grind the content to level 100 to get forward to the next tier for the new content, I think it creates a larger funnel of returning players. The microtransactions should always be for either DLC, powers, which although DLC is now free, you can still buy powers separately that are behind membership or pay for a month of membership and create multiple characters with new powers. That's pretty much what I did. Or the limited edition styles or cosmetic options in the game. Soon as you add in pay to skip options, it usually splits the player base and numbers go down. Having high numbers in a player base does attract new players, at least in my opinion. If I look up a game and it has, let's say, 500 players playing, I will assume my time will be wasted if I pay money for this game. I still think the game could have done extremely well with more of that model. You compare newer style games like Fortnite that went completely free to play with a bunch of cosmetics and they're making billions of dollars. And seeing that cosmetics in this game are highly sought after commodity, they're not necessary for gameplay purposes, but very much wanted by the player base. As of 2021, DC Universe has over 69 million characters created, which when you think about it, that's 69 million different character styles that are created. Every one with its own unique and individual style. And with the addition of time capsules, which are basically loot boxes that can be either earned or purchased, there's plenty of room for profit and the addition of continual new styles. But once you go too far down into the path of microtransactions and pay to win, I think you turn off the casual couch gamer who wants to play the game every once in a while. I'm a big believer once you lose the casual audience, over time the game will continue to lose players and momentum. Although a game can last 12 years and still be operational, someone who has been around since the beginning, game is just a shell of what it once was. Worlds are way less crowded, 
content that isn't the highest level is almost dead, and the community is not as fresh and lively as it once was. So how does a game with so many bad features and decisions make it 12 years? Well, there's a few reasons. The first is a dedicated fan base. If you look at any game that has been around for a while, you will find diehard fans that play that game every day. And that's no different with DC Universe. If you search any forums for advice or log into the game, you will find the players that have been playing for 10 years that even with all the missteps still come back for new content. As long as you have dedicated fans that come to play the game and spend money on the game, it allows the company to continue to put resources into the game. As soon as you stop new content, that's when the game stops. The biggest problem with the DC Universe community is just the toxicity. I see a lot of complaints where players come into the end game content and are not able to keep up. And it's not the player's fault. If I could buy my way to the end game and have all of the skill points that needed to load in, I might not have the skill level to keep up. But if I'm a new player and buy my way to end game content just to get kicked from groups or hated on constantly, I would leave the game instantly. Obviously, that's just a select few of the community. If you're able to find a league of players to play with, usually they are very helpful and nice, and that's the best way to play the game. The second way is adaptation and change. Although a lot of the changes and updates have made certain players mad or rubbed the community wrong, always changing the game to keep it fresh helps rejuvenate the game continually. That can be done through updates like DLC or new powers, but it could also be done by changing the meta or what content you have to grind. Changing the focus from CR to skill points all those years ago gave every player that had maxed out their CR up to that point reason to return to content they have may otherwise ignored to get feats done and gain skill points. Because most players do have multiple characters, at least one per role usually, that meant a lot more hours of playing the game. Another big update was the home base DLC, which allowed players to create their own lair with tons of new content to grind. Even as of 2023, there is said to be a massive graphics overhaul for the end of the year for the new generation of console. Another way to continue to push the game in the right direction even after all these years. Now it might be a little late for the graphics because if you're playing DC Universe by now, it's definitely not for the graphics, but hey, can't knock them for trying. The most important way is by creating a repeatable and engaging game. Where some MMOs fail is they make a really good base game, but they either don't update the game fast enough or the content that is out ends up being boring after a few plays. The core mechanics and gameplay of DC Universe is a fun adventure of partying with friends, fighting enemies through different dungeons and raids, and as long as that is fun, there will always be players who want to play the game. The game differs from something like RuneScape, where it's not a sandbox RPG where you log in, there's no goal in mind, and you figure it out. DC Universe gives you a clear-cut goal of how you want to progress in the game. Obviously, every game has side content, and DC Universe has that side content to keep you busy as well, but the main focus is simple. If you want to spend your time finding every style or completing all of the races, then go for it. But the focus is on combat and leveling your gear. Every other mechanic that is added into the game just adds to the base game that is already there. Adding in things like artifacts, allies, and a home base are just an enticing way to keep people engaged in the core content of the game. It adds new things to look for as you go through new alerts or raids. It's impressive for any game to be getting updates 12 years later, but seeing that DC Universe is still profitable for Daybreak, I don't see it going anywhere. Going almost fully free to play seems like a great option in today's gaming scene as new games with memberships seem to not be a thing anymore. I'm honestly surprised there's no battle pass to be honest. I would love to hear your opinions if you have played the game. Do you consider it to still be a game worth playing or is it only the diehard fans that are playing the game? And if you have never played it before, do you think you would give it a try seeing that it is free to play? It's definitely not as popular as it once was, but it still has some nice nostalgia and good combat mechanics to play with. If you did enjoy this video, drop a like and check out my other critiques and breakdowns I will link on screen and I will see you guys next time.